Well, good afternoon, everyone. Here we are again in the uh, loop and grazing trial at Sword and Station, just outside of Tekapo in New Zealand. Um, it's the 15th of December, so we last checked in about this time a month ago, um, and we're down again for our monthly loop and harvest over summer. Uh, and so the grazing has changed a wee bit over the last month. Um, slightly different, we changed our grazing system to when last time we were here. And today we've just tailed the lambs off this uh, off the pasture and weighed the ewes and also the lambs and so now we're going to the summer period so um, I'll introduce uh, Dr Black he's my PhD supervisor and we're just going to run through some of the changes we've made in the last month and, um, and what we're seeing compared to last year in here so uh, Dr Black what do you reckon for today? Well, it's looking lovely as usual Travis <laughs> but uh, since October uh, when the ewes came onto this paddock this experiment for lambing. Start of October right until about the 20th of November we've been set stocking four of the five paddocks. So that's about about 105 ewes on about seven and a half hectares stocking rate set stocked in four of the five paddocks for lambing and on the 20th of November when we were here last to measure the lupins uh, that was the day when we changed from set stocking in four groups mobbing up into one group and that group of 100 ewes 100 odd ewes and lambs started grazing in block one which is behind Travis at two weeks in there and then back into this paddock here for another two weeks so the, so the mob has just come out of this paddock uh, and clearly they haven't uh, eaten at all there's still plenty of feed uh, available but we really haven't tried to feed uh, to graze all of this forage we've decided to keep on a fortnightly shift uh, rotational grazing through summer up until weaning which will be about the second week of February uh, and then we'll destock for a little bit uh, and come back on for um, uh, uh, pre-mating okay. for March, April, May. So last November we were hitting peak yields uh, the paddock that hadn't been grazed uh, for three months in spring um, yielded on average about nine and a half tons of dry matter per hectare and with a dry matter percentage of about 15% on average uh, and that was on average for that paddock but peak um, our maximum measurements uh, our, our strips that we cut well they yielded about 12 to 13 tonnes of dry matter per hectare so okay. in three months 12 to 13 tonnes of dry matter per hectare since September, October uh, till mid-November that's pretty good growth uh, mm. in this environment when you're looking around in, in the neighbouring paddocks um, much more than compared to those crops uh, the, lo the Lucerne crop just over Edward Stream uh, to to your left. Yep. Uh, so that's that way. <laughs> and, and that crop hadn't been uh, harvested uh, this season, but that was cut uh, when we were here last on the 20th of November, and we took some cuts off that and measured that crop to yield about three and a half tons, 3.6 tons of dry matter per hectare on average. So, you know, a nine and a half ton crop, uh, spring primary uh, yield for the lupins versus three and a half tons for lucerne, yeah. uh, you know, fourfold in improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so, very good yields we're seeing from these crops. And the next question is, you know, do these lambs perform on it? So, today we were tailing the lambs and we also weighed all of the ewes and we've got them all air tagged. So, now we have all of the ewe weights so we can see how their body condition has changed, their body weights have changed coming into the summer. And also we just tagged with individual numbers all of the lambs uh, and we've got weights from those two. So we'll be looking at the data in the next two or three days and we're comparing those weights with uh, our same control tagged animals on, on the conventional pastures. And they're, they're on some lucent crops at the moment. So this time last year, uh, the ewes on the lupins were just doing, well, they lost a wee bit of weight on, on the lucerne, uh, on the lupins rather. And um, whereas on the lucerne, on the conventional pastures, they tended to maintain weight. The lambs all grew pretty much at the same weight. I think the, the lambs this time last year at tailing on the lupins were maybe about a kilo, kilo and a half on average lighter than the, the lambs off the control. But this year the lambs are looking very good from the lupins. Um, the crop themselves, so evidence of, of what the 
you know, whether the ewes actually eat lupins, um, even at this light stocking rate, we're seeing clear evidence for preference for the leaf, uh, the, the, the flower. So here we've got a, uh, a typical lupin plant here, uh, just browsing off, taking off some of the flower material, nibbling off some of these nutritious flower buds here. Um, and even when you look across the paddock, here's a patch of the paddock that the mob didn't get into within the fortnight that they had in here grazing. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more flower remaining, but when you pan across to the left, uh, clearly they've been spending a lot more time in this half of the paddock mm. and they've already eaten off that, off that flower material. Uh, not only the flower, they are eating the, the lamina or the leaf material here, so still very palatable. And we've got some dry matter percent data saying, and some DND analysis saying that these leaves will actually average a DMD of about 80 to 82 okay. percent right throughout the growing season. So from October right through to April, May, okay. this will have quite a constant DM percent. Uh, and the petiole or the, or the leaf stem, it's hollow, so still quite palatable, a bit more fibrous than the leaf. Uh, but with, if you keep the mob in here for long enough, they'll eat more of the leaf and then hook into and start eating on the petiole. Uh, and they'll leave a lot of the true stem behind, much more woody, and you don't really don't want to eat all of that. Yeah. Okay. Not only that, in the lupin plant, they're also eating what's growing in between the plants. So, and I think this is actually very important. Um, so this, the resident grass species, and we're seeing um, several annual types. We've got some brome, annual brome species here, and we've actually got some um, Italian ryegrass here and some perennial rye in here too that went in in the original seed mix about 10 or so years ago. Mm. Uh, and this is growing with the nitrogen fixed from the plant. Mm. Okay, so this is an area that we really need to get some get some more research into. Uh, not only what the animals eat and the, the nutritional value of the feed over the time, but also the quality of the companion grasses uh, and plants, palatable plant species growing amongst them. As I suspect, these are growing from the nitrogen fix from from the mother lupin mm. plants here. It doesn't matter if the if the ewes leave a lot of the lupin plants behind; they're still growing, they're still intercepting and fixing. Uh, nitrogen intercepting light for nitrogen fixation uh, and giving some of that nitrogen to the grass plant. so I think that's very useful. So in terms of um, it's it's one of the few legumes we've sort of found that uh, actually can get above the grass and shaded well you know get its advantage whereas we find a lot of the other conventional legumes tend to get shaded out by the grass. Yeah, finally we've got a legume that can actually outcompete yeah. uh, the, the companion grass species so now the grass is a minor component, um, but when you look at a preference point of view of most ruminant animals, if you know, when given free choice, that that animal will select you know 60, 70 percent of the diet being legume. Uh, I wonder if that model, that idea, holds for lupins. Um, certainly, if we can provide majority of the forage as this as this lupin material, even if they don't eat the whole plant, which they're not going to, mm. there's still plenty of feed to carry, yeah. what, 15 to 20 stock units a hectare through spring uh, on, this, on this forage. Yeah, so the, the true advantage really, I mean, from animal performance, we're probably um, on a par with what, what else we can feed them in terms of that being looser, our, 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 what we think of as the ice cream of the two crops, I suppose. So the advantage comes from the cost of maintaining this as a crop compared to other crops in terms of fertiliser inputs and things like that. Absolutely. So farmers in this environment, in the Mackenzie Basin, uh, might have two options if they're going for thinking about what forage that they want to grow as a crop. Uh, a lot of guys will want to grow lupin, uh, lucerne, uh, but they can only do so where they can. So that requires uh, a reasonable development cost, getting the pH right. Lucerne will not tolerate low pH in aluminium soils. So uh, lucerne might be devoted to some of those environments in the areas of the property where it is economically, economically feasible to grow lucerne. Uh, where it's not, this can be a uh, potential low cost alternative. Yep. We already know we've got 30, 40 years of data uh, from the nearby Mount John Research Centre which has shown um, undoubtedly that lupins actually survives for 15, 20, 25 years with low fertiliser inputs at very modest pH levels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whereas lucerne does not. So, 
this is potential alternative to Lucerne in those environments where it's just not e economically feasible mm. to, to get a good uh, Lucerne crop. And to get a good lupin crop essentially it's establishment year that's very important um, and it also it likes a bit of sulphur doesn't it? Um, so it if, but in the establishment year as with any um, sort of legume in this environment where the resident species are quite well adapted to this difficult sort of harsh environment um, yeah they just need everything right going in their first year and then you get a good thick crop like this that continues to thicken year on and year out. So yeah, the history of this crop, this is a 10 year old stand, uh, very deep stand now, uh, back at the establishment, Snow Loxon, the farmer, uh, the owner of this crop here, his notes uh, at establishment indicated that it was um, just a light till with a maxi till, uh, and then he put on a fruit salad seed mix which contained about, we had 10 hectares in, in here, uh, put on lupin seed at about 5 kilos to the hectare, plus a bit of, um, I think he had some barley left over, uh, and uh, some Italian rye, a little bit of white clover went in the mix, I don't see any white clover now, yep. um, but even at that light lupin sowing rate, 5 kilos to the hectare, mm -hmm. over time um, the crop will thicken, it's every every year when you let the flower let it flower, um, form pods, pods drop seed. Those seeds are viable, and a good proportion of that will those seeds will germinate. Yeah, so it's a it's a trade off at your establishment with your sowing rate, isn't it? You can go lighter and let it thicken for a year, but you're not going to get that productivity in the first year. Or you can sow a bit heavier, which costs you a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but you get a, it gives you a little bit more security around your first season, and also. Um, and we're seeing yeah. guys put in, um, putting, wanting to put lupin in big areas. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking 10 hectare paddocks in yeah. this environment, we're talking 50, 100 hectare blocks. Yeah. And it's just not economic to, to at the current market prices for lupin seed to go and put mm. 30 or 40 kilos a hectare of lupin seed on okay. and get a dense stand uh, after the first year. So it's really seen as um, a lower sowing rate to start with on, on commercial practices in this environment uh, and then waiting over time um, for that, that crop to thicken uh, and, and, and establish itself through seed dispersal. Okay, and that's good and I think our final lambing percentages were basically exactly the same for the control mob and for the lupin mob weren't they? We had 116% versus 117 on the lupins so very similar there. Lambs are looking good. Yeah. Lambs are looking good this year. We had some, some big ones. We had just finished lifting them all so we had about uh, <laughs> some somewhere up to 28 29 kilos yep um, I'd say well it's hard to say what the average are is for right now we had the lightest ones about 13 15 kilos okay yep, but we'll look at the results later yeah we'll get back to you with that well thanks Alistair and um, I think we'll carry on with our journeys for the day but it was nice to get out here and um, see this great crop once again sort of towering above everything in the Mackenzie country so have a good Christmas and uh, New Year's everyone <laughs> catch you next time see ya.